Okay, so I have been doing um, some kind of readings uh, as part of a uh, hope to kind of get a grasp on uh, the intersection of uh, aesthetics uh, and theology and embodiment and kind of think about the ways that uh, aesthetic and embodiment influence uh, kind of biblical scholarship as well as theology. And uh, so this time was uh, the first kind of uh, big... Uh, important uh, waystone kind of in, in my travel, um, Hans Urs von Balthasar. And uh, this is the, the Balthasar reader, the von Balthasar reader, uh, Kale and Loser. Um, not useful, or at least it wasn't useful to me uh, for who someone who's fairly competent with theological literature uh, but unfamiliar with Balthazar, with Balthazar, and also trying to figure out like how it is he deals uh, with aesthetics uh, and theology. I started looking in here. I found a couple um, things regarding uh, revelation and kind of uh, dialogical theology and whether or not we should think of it as a science and what the intersection is between theology and philosophy and some things that like kind of in a beating around the bush kind of way had to do with aesthetics, but uh, I couldn't get it. Now, that could just be me, but what I then did is said, man, there's got to be a better way to do this, and kind of went hunting around, and I found an awesome journal article for anyone who's interested uh, in a concise, very well articulated, uh, and I think fairly incisive uh, analysis, I say without really knowing von Balthasar personally, um, in uh, the essay Von Balthasar's Way from Doxology to Theology by Kevin Moingrain uh, in Theology Today from 2007. Moingrain is at um, the Notre Dame where he teaches, uh, I think, systematic theology there. Uh, now, what this uh, essay does, this article, is it points us to some kind of key insights that von Balthasar has from a number of different texts, and uh, in so doing, it's kind of, uh, kind of cribbing from his bibliography, it turns out the book uh, that I really wanted to be looking at um, was something other than the reader. And so uh, I'd like to just take a little bit of time to kind of talk about uh, the kind of masterworks of von Balthasar so that people can have a... a a sense of uh, the way that he wrote, what he wrote, and uh, how it is and why it is that aesthetics is important to that project in general. So uh, his masterwork is a <laughs> uh, is called a trilogy, and it is um, it begins with the glory of the Lord uh, and moves to Theo drama, and then theologic. Now, I scare-quoted uh, Trilogy because The Glory of the Lord, the first volume of the trilogy, uh, has seven volumes in it. Each of them is book length. And they're similarly uh, lengthy uh, second and third volumes. So it's, it's really, I think, a 17-volume trilogy. Um, but uh, what's relevant is that in The Glory of the Lord, uh, the first volume of it is a, a book called um, Seeing the Form. So, The Glory of the Lord, colon, Seeing the Form. Basically, um, von Balthasar wants to um, reconfigure what the category of beauty is and uh, consider how it is that Theology is less than complete without uh, the category of beauty being part of what theological thinking is. It is no mistake that the first volume of his kind of uh, umpteen volume master trilogy begins with revelation, seeing the form, understanding uh, how God is revealed in the world, and that as part of that, aesthetics is at the heart. It's uh, an argument that Monger makes that the, the reason that it's so much associated with him 
Uh, and the reason why I couldn't find it immediately when I was looking in the von Balthasar reader is because it's so central to what he thinks about it, and he says it so early on that it becomes like the 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 rock on which all the rest of his work is done, and it's hard to see immediately. Uh, you know, when you're looking at the forest, when the tree you're looking for is at the very beginning of the entrance, all the way to the other side. What I like about um, when Balthazar is thinking about this is that it's one of the first places where I'm clearly seeing uh, distinct linkages between aesthetics and embodiment in terms of kind of thinking about both theology and revelation uh, in terms of interpreting scripture. He uses uh, the word aestheticism, which is to say you know, when it is the, the, the seeking out of aesthetics for aesthetics' own sake kind of gets in the way of actually engaging with or seeking God, well, then it absolutely is a problem. Uh, he's negative about asceticism, and he points out actually that um, in the uh, suffering servant passage in Isaiah, uh, beauty is only used as a word to deny that that word could apply to the suffering servant. Um, so, you know, there is, there is a very significant theme in which von Balthasar is, is in some ways standing back away from aesthetics, but is also simultaneously saying, look, there's all these problems, we can get hooked into it, we can make it an idol, this, 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 and this, but we absolutely have to have it uh, included in theology. Um, because, and he, he sets it up here, this is from Mongrin here, I'm on page 60, uh, 59, sorry. This is Mongrain. If theology means nothing but abstract proposition about God's truth presented to the intellect for its purely cognitive assent, well, then there is no reason for a theology of God's beauty. For von Balthasar, subverting this quasi-rationalist obsession with proving and explaining God is the whole point of reintroducing aesthetics into theology. It would not help theology much either to speak of beauty in purely theoretical terms which would simply result in changing abstract theological rationalism into a theological asceticism that asserts pious-sounding propositions about God's beauty. The last thing Christianity needs, von Balthasar might say, is yet another doctrinal system of airy speculations, even if it purports to inform our heads about the existence of some wispy, sickly ghost called Lord Beauty. If, however, theology is properly understood in its biblical and traditional sense as reflection directly and deeply rooted in the church's life of prayer and spirituality, then it is clear that one cannot truthfully speak of the glorious revelation of God's love in salvation history without the genuine aid of genuine aesthetics. Von Balthasar argues so forcefully for reintegrating beauty into theology because he believes that failing to do so would mean failing to understand and attain the existential disposition and spiritual posture required for knowing God in the only way God can possibly be known, namely, as self-giving love offered in the gift of creation and, ultimately, in the gift of incarnation. Von Balthasar says that given that the ultimate revelation of God to us is in Christ Jesus, and that Christ Jesus took on flesh, and that flesh is part of the way we engage with the creation around us, it is necessary to have an aesthetic appreciation and aesthetics be part of theology because that is the means by which we engage with the created order. Uh, without it, we can become uh, completely abstract, focus too much on the created order and how beautiful and aesthetically pleasing it is, and we are focusing on the wispy, sickly Lord beauty. So in between those two, uh, there is what uh, von Balthasar calls uh, his aesthetic theology. So the setup that von Balthasar has um, is uh, kind of parallel to what um, Buber sets up. And, and Buber says um, that, that the theologian must walk a narrow ridge between uh, dogmatic legalism on one side and speechless relativism on the other. Uh, and von Balthasar says 
that um, the balance is between dogmatism on the one side and aestheticism on the other. It's a kind of fixation on beauty for beauty's sake. Uh, and so it, it is into this balance that he says uh, aesthetics must be uh, injected so that theology is done properly. Uh, why? Well, uh, because uh, von Balthasar finds a close analogy between the receptive existential disposition required to perceive worldly beauty and the receptive spiritual posture necessary to encounter God's love. There's kind of an a intuitive learning, a knack, that we get better at um, when we perceive the world uh, and beauty in the world, and that that uh, kind of allows us to more clearly uh, or, or regularly perceive uh, God's love. There's a, a kind of a, an analogous, um, I think, connection to uh, the way that... Um, Elaine Scarry thinks about uh, perceptual uh, acuity uh, and the fact that beauty uh, is to be cultivated um, and the perception of beauty to be encouraged because we get better at seeing beauty and ugliness, including social beauty and ugliness. I think, that, I think there's a parallel there. Uh, but Balthazar terms the healthy traditional integration of aesthetics and theology as theological aesthetics. But he terms unhealthy, modern attempts at integration, aesthetic theology. So this is a difference in terminology for him. Uh, aesthetic theology, which is the bad stuff, uh, presupposes a disposition that's fundamentally at odds with Christian spirituality, and hence it too is at odds with the authentic meaning of the beautiful. Aesthetic theology perverts the meaning of beauty because it fundamentally lacks a genuine Christian spirituality. Why is that? What's, what's the problem with this aesthetic theology? Well, it operates with an anxious existential disposition that fears the dark, chaotic, and deathly sides of existence. If it, in an effort to persuade itself the world is pretty, sweet, and utterly safe and secure, it turns away from biblical revelation to invent some sterile, conceptual understanding of beauty, which it then projects onto its happy, smiling God. Life is beautiful because God is beautiful, and God is beautiful because life is beautiful, and so on and so on, in a self-tranquilizing loop. Right on, what Balthazar. Uh, what we're, we're having a problem with here is the kind of uh, projection, the hermeneutical uh, kind of stamping onto uh, the special revelation of the Bible of our hopes that the world is peachy keen and everything's going to turn out all right. And therefore, instead of uh, reading scripture, which can sometimes be terrifying, uh, and reading it as such, we kind of gloss it and just read the happy, sweet things, uh, kind of lorded over by the sickly, sweet, wispy Lord Beauty, instead of saying, kind of turning the thing inside out and realizing that beauty sometimes is terrifying. Um, I think that from, for von Balthasar, and I would need to do more reading to kind of clarify this, that there's kind of a fusing of the sublime and the beautiful, the way that Kant uses it, uh, in that he, he wants the world um, to, to, to be taken into his theology. He needs it, in fact. This um, kind of theological aesthetics requires that um, the fleshliness of the world be taken into account. It is, in fact, the, the broken body of, of Christ and the... the the valence of the, the created order is tangibleness that matters to him. We need to take in the horror of the world uh, because beauty is there too. It's not that the horribleness of the world and the dark things of the world um, are good, really, if we understand it, but that beauty pervades that not just in spite of, but way down deep beauty is, is what uh, is kind of constitutive of the created order. And uh, when we understand that, we can come to see that, that, that God is there standing behind it, not making everything kind of fluffy and rainbow puppy happy candy, but standing there uh, kind of in a stalwart way that we can trust 
and no is kind of bending the arc of the universe towards justice. Um, so, uh, interesting stuff. Links on theimageoffish.com, and uh, I imagine that I'll be doing more reading in those two texts on Von Balthazar. So uh, 